Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'd like to talk about our deep learning processor, as Andy said. Um, so yeah, um, one thing I should mention this peta scale. What I mean by that is we do mean a peta flop, but these are going to be 8-bit and 16-bit deep learning flops, so not IEEE double precision flops. So if any of you are from the HPC community, uh, don't get too excited there. Huh? It's not IEEE, but yeah. So just a quick gauge. Um, how many of you are familiar with deep learning? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, all right. Uh, so just, just for, oh, one thing before I start. Um, our name used to be Andromeda LLC. That was our legal name. But now with uh, Y Combinator, we're changing to Vathis. So just to clear up any confusion there. So yeah, I have this slide basically for the sake of completeness. Um, basically, deep learning workloads, as you know, have uh, require huge amounts of data to be uh, shuffled for pretty long distances. And to do uh, once in a while, you do have to compute on them. Um, so basically, that's kind of the workload we're trying to accelerate. I have an image of a continent up there. Of course, we uh, LSTMs and RNNs are also pretty common. So, yeah, and of course, in this day and age, if you want to build a chip, then it better be for, uh, and it's a specialized chip, so not a general purpose processor, then it better be for a work workload worth accelerating. And so rather than bore you with a bunch of bullet points, I just thought I'd show this uh, chart, which is a little bit outdated, as you can see, but I think it's the general point across. So deep learning is a worth, workload worth accelerating. What do you mean? Uh, per percentage in error rate. Yeah, error rate on ImageNet. Yeah, and things have improved as well in, so, from 2015. So when we first started this company, basically, uh, we wanted to provide really an order of magnitude over what, uh, over, well, two orders of magnitude over GPUs, but also kind of order of magnitude on what's the best you could do if you were uh, kind of optimizing for compute. And so what we had is a, per, a pretty ambitious target, I guess you could say, is we wanted to cram a petaflop, and again, these are 8-bit and 16-bit flops, uh, into TDP and something similar to the Volta in around uh, 300 watts, right? So, and uh, other thing about this is we didn't just want to say, oh, we have a petaflop of available performance you could get on some magical workload that like a unicorn, right? No, we wanted to get uh, a petaflop that you can actually see in real life on real world networks. And so just for example, there I have, uh, that is a hyperlink to accelerate that benchmark to Volta on uh, LSTMs. And they saw that it wasn't nearly as good as uh, what the adver advertised 120 teraflops was. And the primary reason for that really is you simply can't feed those computing units uh, fast enough. And really, the primary reason for this, if you think about what the state of the art memory systems are right now, is right, right something like high bandwidth memory, high bandwidth 2, I think. Yeah, so high bandwidth 2 is on something in order of several hundred gigabytes. And if you just cram a petaflop under, you won't be able to feed the thing enough. Oh, yeah. And so can't, can't we just wait until Moore's Law saves us, right? So this is kind of the question that's, uh, well, for any, pretty much any, previous um, special purpose processor, excluding perhaps a couple of niche applications. It's just basically been Moore's law that's kind of wiped everything away, uh, preventing general, uh, preventing special purpose uh, entrance from making a head, headway into it. And really, the answer to that is not really, because it, this is a point of some contention, like whether or not Moore's law itself has actually slowed down, you know. But more importantly, regardless of whether or not you think Moore's law itself has actually failed, is that this is a very nice thing called Denard scaling. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Denard scaling is basically, the, as a rough approximation, it's that we have double the number of transistors, but they're approximately half the power consumption uh, due to the reduction in the nominal VDD. And as a result, we're able to, in the same power consumption, get double the number of transistors, and everything's dandy. And that really hasn't been true from like the 40 nanometer and definitely from 28 nanometer node. And this one is actually from NVIDIA that points that out. So. And just to give an example of what we, what we didn't want in any uh, petascale deep learning processor we made, uh, this is, again, not to, I should note that this is an April Fool's joke that Adapteva put out, so I'm not trying to denigrate Adapteva, great company. But basically, you know, there's like, it, it's no use if all it is is a completely fixed purpose matrix multiplier with no on-chip memory, and it consumes like a kilowatt of power, right? It's not really super useful. So that's what we really don't want one to make when we're talking about a petascale deep learning processor. So in order to reach our goal, our somewhat ambitious goal, then we need to be pretty much 10 times better 
than what the uh, current batch of offerings are. And the question I immediately get is, how on earth is that possible, right? These are supposed to be processors already optimized for deep learning. How can you be, um, even hope to get 10 times better than what they're getting? And basically the question is, start where there's uh, three orders of magnitude difference, right? So right now, compute for the most part for deep learning uh, operations is measured in something under order of femtojoules. But the cost of doing uh, access to memory, let's say high bandwidth memory, uh, it, it's going to be in the under order of picajoules. So like, if you see something floating around like, okay, we have several petaops of performance, then you quickly find out that you need some hundreds of kilowatts to uh, feed that thing with mem memory, which isn't really, isn't really feasible. So. So again, basically what's the obstacle to our little deep learning supercomputer on a chip, right? And that, if you're from the semiconductor industry, you know that has a completely different connotation there. Uh, but basically the problem is really data movement, as I was saying. Um, so the problem that I run into a lot of the time when I try to bring this up is that people say, okay, well, what if we just, in some isolated cases, we can put all our memory on die? Does, it, does that not solve our problem? And the answer to that is really no, because yes, you solve one serious component, which is the off-chip memory access. But what you don't solve is the on-chip data movement problem. And that's characterized by going to be the RC quadratic problem, right, the interconnects. And um, this is a problem that's, I can think, coming more into focus as Exascale kind of grapples with these issues, and hence the uh, timely source there uh, from Horst Simon at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. And really the issue that he points out is that look, it costs us even more to move data on chip than it does to do an operation upon it. So this is really a problem that needs to be tackled that at least for the most part isn't being addressed right now. So kind of to re reiterate the same point, um, that really this uh, 10 to 20% of the problem has kind of been the focus here, right? So we've seen companies um, and a lot of literature as well say, okay, well we can do away with floating point, we can stick, um, they're just fixed point operations and that buys us some power, um, buys us some performance even. But really you're, you're missing the 80-90% of the, 80-90% of the problem which is, oh, I the 80-90% problem which is the uh, data movement cost and the memory cost. And um, as you can see of course LSTM is going to require more but um, chances are as the models progress in, uh, progress through time they're going to get more complicated, require even more memory and that's going to become a serious, uh, well, it, it is already a bottleneck, but going to continue to strangle the system, right? And so the source from this is from uh, DARPA, which itself is actually from a uh, source here at Stanford, so. Yeah. The data has to come from somewhere, right? It's probably coming from like, you know, a disk drive or the internet or something, so, which is much, much slower than, your, than sure. your memory. So, you know, you could optimize this, but it'll just move you, I mean, it seems like you already have a much worse bottleneck, which is I.O. Right, so I.O. is a di different problem, but like um, when I talk about data movement here, maybe I should have clarified, I meant more data movement for the activations, right, since those are going to be very large, the activation tensors and the weight memory. So data movement in that way. Yeah, yeah, internal communication, yeah. I mean, sorry, maybe I should have cl clarified. I mean, there are other ways to deal with I.O. as well, right? But yeah, it, it is a problem. So yeah, this side is pretty sparse. So for us, no one, uh, no one solution is really going to uh, tackle the entire entirety of the problem. So we really need to uh, take a tax problem along multiple angles. So we do it at the architectural level and circuit and device level as you can see up there. So let's dive into the architecture. Um, it's a it's again optimized to uh, it's optimized to reduce data movement, right, as I said. And so to give you some concrete numbers on that, um, on average it's on 28 nanometer, by the way, is, um, so we're basically getting the average interconnect length of 50 microns. So if, you're, if you have uh, some idea of what CMOS uh, interconnect modeling looks like, for the most part this has been the resistance uh, negligible regime. And for the most part, at least on 28 nanometer for us, we can get away with not having a repeater. So this is a big advantage in terms of power, obviously. Uh, those repeaters also leak like crazy, but in terms of the data movement problem, it does reduce, it, uh, reduce the cost of that data movement quite significantly just at the architectural level. Uh, it is a data flow architecture, and it's data flow architectures are kind of, uh, well, I guess they've been thrown by the wayside a little bit because in, in a way the ideal workload for them hasn't really been found. Uh, deep learning pretty much is in many ways the ideal workload for it since the uh, primary uh, form of uh, deep learning, I guess, 
primary form of expression for deep learning is a computational graph, right? TensorFlow graphs, PyTorch, um, well, PyTorch is dynamic, but at the end of the day, what you're really modeling is, is a computational graph. And that maps really well to data flow architectures. And if you're familiar with the literature um, at all, on uh, kind of these sorts of neural network processors is that there's a lot of data reuse optimizations that are possible, uh, particularly for convolution, which is that you bring the data in from some memory bank, you can actually reuse and do some work on it, way more work on it before you have to put it back and bring it back in again. And so as a result, you can save a significant amount of power and everything, obviously. And so and there's been a couple of examples in literature, the iris, um, iris is one that comes to mind from MIT. Uh, but basically, we're a decent bit ahead of literature as of the moment right now. So this is important because for the majority of workloads, um, probably most people aren't going to be running some really exotic network. So for the majority of workloads, you're going to see a pretty good speed up on that, which is important to getting to our goal. We have what we call a uh, tensor native memory architecture. So a little bit of a, a buzzword in a way. but. Basically, what this essentially means is that instead of having something like a scratch pad memory or something, you basically have something where you address large contiguous regions of memory, and it's a tensor, and it the slices of the tensor. And so a slice of that large contiguous sector. And this is useful because in deep learning, you're very rarely going to access, like, let's say, one specific point randomly. So as a result, by uh, making by setting up the memory structure in this way, you're able to get more bandwidth um, from it, you're able to, uh, and be able to do that lower power as well. And it allows you to set, set up, this is more a circuit level thing, but it allows you to set up some pretty nice uh, bit line capacitance reduction, which is in pretty much any modern memory array is a significant source of the power consumption. And one final thing is that we pipeline to expose parallelism. So uh, GPUs nowadays, right, so the way you get throughput and performance is to load up 256 or so images at the same time, run them through in parallel, and that's how you get throughput. Uh, we don't do that. We basically have the entire thing as a giant um, pipeline that's, uh, and that way as you go through that, of course, you can expose some really nice parallelism. And the uh, big kicker for us is that one uh, DLE, uh, our DLEs are a core equivalent, basically. It's a deep learning element. It has all the memory it needs. So not only uh, is there no memory required off die, but there is also no memory required um, outside of the local region, which is about 500 microns by 500 microns. Uh, outside the one DLE. So that saves on-chip data movement uh, quite significantly. Yeah, so here's kind of uh, just a high-level overview of what we're looking at. Um, we just have nine DLEs. I want to show a GDS2 here, but we're thinking of changing foundry, so wasn't able to do that. Plus, it's kind of hard to see what all the wires in the way. But just I have nine of them for illustration purposes here. Just know for uh, petascale chip, obviously nine won't fly. You're going to need something like 2,400 of them. And in terms of ALUs, that translates to about 200K uh, ALUs. Um, so basically, as you can see, um, there's a little more in this, but we haven't finished uh, filing on that. So, uh, But basically, in general, what we want is one DLE should approximately map to one layer. So this is something pretty nice. So you take a ResNet, lay it out, pretty easy uh, for to lay out for, any, for the software side of things. Um, so to give you an idea of about how big these DLEs are and how, uh, I guess, performant each one is, um, obviously, it's possible that some layers are going to be much bigger, and in this case, uh, you can several DLEs can basically work together. And the most common way to do this is going to be that one DLE basically operates by taking all the memory from the other DLEs, because uh, most more likely than not, the layer is not going to fit into one DLE by uh, because it doesn't have enough memory. And since the memory is a, the most, at least it's close to at least around 80 to 90 percent of the die of each DLE, so it's probably going to take the memory from um, neighboring DLEs. And so the way the interconnection works is also very, uh, as you can see, is pretty simple. It's a grid layout with one, with one exception, which is what these things which we call flyover networks, which are basically, um, as a sound, they allow, um, instead of having neighbor, nearest neighbor connections, they allow uh, connections to uh, kind of further DLEs. And the reason why that's useful is because we're starting to uh, add these things called skip connections, pretty uh, common to, uh, pretty common nowadays, but basically the general idea is that normal, uh, well, normal, well, previously, like something like AlexNet would just have um, layer one feeds into layer two, feeds into layer three, and so forth. So very nice and simple DLE mapping. But now we have ResNets, which maybe have uh, one to four, uh, layer one to four has a connection. And, you know, that uh, that's possible in a grid layout, but also more inefficient. So these flyover networks basically allow for faster communication there. And um, we, there's a level one and level two. Right now, I just have one for illustration purposes. 
And this is pr useful because um, the layer one basically interconnects three DLEs, so um, in a row and in a column. And the uh, level two network interconnects the entire row of them. So that's for more general purpose programmability. Uh, it's slower, of course, but allows for more general purpose uh, programming. And there's no real, okay, there's no major instruction decoders like you're probably used to, like uh, you have uh, some amount of instruction memory and you have some dynamic instruction decoder and you can program it that way. Instead, it's programmed like a CGRA would be. So like a coarse grain reconfigurable array, it's similar to that. It's kind of an analogy in a way. So basically you statically reconfigure it and if you're using some like dynamic graphs, then um, we have a mechanism to support that as well. Basically you lay out how it could be um, how all the possibilities the graph could take, and then you decide dynamically where to go. So kind of like TensorFlow Fold, if you're familiar with that, mapped onto hardware. And the entire chip is asynchronous, so these, uh, so these I.O. interfaces basically, their, their job is to make the chip look synchronous from the out, to the outside world, but internally it's asynchronous. So this input basically uh, receives its input uh, at the clock signals, and, that, and then basically that part is much simpler, it simply uh, is the, the clock is simply seen as the asynchronous uh, validation token. And on the outside, there's a little bit more work for the output interface, which basically has to take the, um, basically has to ready the, um, ready the asynchronous, what's well, an asynchronous basically amount of data being flowed through and turning that into some sort of clock that the outside world is gonna see. And these each have uh, small buffers associated with them as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's distributed in each daily to distribute memory to each of them, or, or how, and how does like cross-addressability work? So cross-addressability means you, you have to fuse them, so that would be done statically. So you take one step where you load all the memory yeah. in, and then, you, yeah. and then you do it. Yeah, so there would be one step where you configure basically how the memory is going to be used. So for example, if I were to do something like a, a convolutional net, I would yeah. have a huge, would I have to unroll that outside and then load it in? So, uh, so you know how it's a, you do like say a three by three. You have to sure. first take the image and you have to un unroll it into a, ni a nine fold bigger image, right? You mean for uh, the intercall implementation? Yeah, I mean I, I don't know. Is there a better implementation? Yeah, well, we basically do the spatial convolution uh, directly, but the way it works is basically um so yeah so if the input interfaces will like um like I guess kind of store the entirety of the uh, input bef as much as you want until it goes into DLEs. If, Maybe we're not answering your question. Yeah, I, I think I see it. I think I see okay, it. yeah. All right. <coughs> I'll talk more also offline the more detail. Yeah, and here's kind of a general block diagram. It's uh, kind of coarse grain, but gives you a general idea of what it looks like. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So we did say that we have circuit level improvements. So I guess an underappreciated source of data movement, and I put that in quotes because when you think of data movement, you usually think shuffling large activation tensors or large weight matrices. But there's also um, clock lines which do transmit some form of information. So in a way kind of data movement, but not exactly. So basically the reason why this is important now or actually has been historically as well is because this consumes a significant amount of power. And there's other issues with it as well that as maybe a consumer you don't care too much about, but the designer has to deal with clock skew, jitter, and all these issues which are really irritating. But so historically the solution to this has been something called asynchronous logic, which is this somewhat bold notion of let's say, let's get rid of the clock and basically put the onus on the circuit elements to perform data validity uh, checks. But basically the problem is that historically there's something like a 2x or greater overhead. Like, if you look at, for example, null convention logic, um, you're, you're pretty much going to have a dual rail implementation where you essentially end up doubling the number of rails for every Boolean value you would have. And you'd have to have um, possibly more depending on your implementation. You might need hysteresis, uh, holdback, and um, other additional transistors as well. And the problem is it's, it's not really super feasible to put that A into a commercial product and B to make that uh, necessarily super performance such that it doesn't impact your area too much. And so our implementation, and this is at the 4-bit ALU level for a full custom implementation, um, is 10%. So if you've been into any of the async conferences, you'll know that that's probably quite a leap um, from what you're used to seeing. And I do need to mention it's uh, a full custom design, so it's, that doesn't mean that we can synthesize any arbitrary uh, circuit into that. But for the purposes of our deep learning chip, it's uh, adequate and get very uh, high performance. So I, yeah, and of course you get all the additional performance and other guarantees of 
async. Um, if you can satisfy the QDI requirements, then you're probably, uh, depending on, well, we use uh, QDI, but if you can satisfy those QDI requirements, then you get the functionality immune to uh, process variations, much higher performance. And we have about a 12 gigahertz clock. And I, of course, gigahertz and clock are in quotes because that's just the average number of oscillations per second uh, instead. And this is on 20 again, so. Yeah, and to just to give you an example, this is our simulated data at uh, 0.7 VDD. So, uh, and basically these 4-bit ALUs are pipelined to make uh, full max. And you can see uh, well below 80 second delay. And the uh, interesting thing about this, uh, these clock rates, so to speak, is that the memory access is actually uh, much closer to being done within one cycle, uh, as long as the pipeline can be warmed up. And so what we do is this really cool thing where we actually use the dynamic logic in the uh, sense amps. So we're actually able to utilize this to pipeline the memory um, and almost access the memory in what, what one oscillation cycle would look at look like. And so this is something somewhat similar to if you look at CPUs, for example. They might be running at 4 gigahertz, but that's only going to be available if you're shuffling data into registers. But for the most part, your L1 data cache, for example, might require uh, something like four or five cycles to access. And of course, more cycles, more the deeper you go into hierarchy, the worse it is. So we're actually able to pipeline to get something pretty close to running at what our uh, logic elements are running at, which is pretty important to maintaining good performance. Uh, so just to give some data um, in some pretty waveforms, uh, this is a done ready signal, um, which is pretty much critical to all asynchronous implementations. I have to put almost because there's some exotic ones like Venn Junction out there. Um, so compared to, compared to standard cell uh, implementation, again on 28 nanometer, uh, depending on the voltage, it's going to depending on the voltage, it's going to vary. Um, so we're, we aim to run around uh, a nominal VDD of 0.7 volts. So it, uh, that we get some very nice advantages, uh, much faster and much uh, lower power than the standard cell implementation. Huh? In the waveform? Yeah. Um, I think the green. The green one is ours. Yeah. The yeah. The green one is standard ours. Standard. Right. It's standard cell. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I did mention that getting moving data off die is extremely expensive. So basically, the question is, if uh, how can we fix that, right? So the immediate solution is, well, let's just put everything onto the die. Unfortunately, for the majority of use cases, this isn't really super feasible. Um, you can only get so much memory with the 60s RAM cell. So the solution, our solution, is, well, let's get get rid of 60s RAM cell. And so new memory cells, new memory technologies in general kind of have a uh, troubled past. Um, so for us, we have to have a couple of requirements, which is that if we, if in order for it to work, especially being a startup, we need to have a couple of things, which is we can't have any new materials, which is absolutely critical, and we can't even have any process modifications. So this includes a new litho steps or anything um, of that variety. So we were actually able to get that, and we call it zero change to the process itself after uh, zero change silicon photonics, which means basically we're able to use a standard process and get this memory cell on there. Um, but basically, we're able, uh, I should mention one thing. We do need one, um, one feature, which is generally considered an RF feature, but um, is on 28, um, 16, 7, and we've caught, talked to TSMC, uh, Samsung Global Foundries, and they have no, no plans to deprecate that. Um, feature so far, but for the sake of completion, I do need to include that we need that feature for the cell to function. And so uh, it's not something exotic like a MIM capacitor, but it is necessary. But the results are quite nice, so we're able to get five times denser than the standard 60S RAM. If we enable multi-level, approximately 10 times denser um, than, again, the standard 60S RAM. And of course, the big advantage here is in leakage. Uh, SRAM leakage probably uh, dominates a large portion, especially when you have a lot of memory, probably dominates the uh, leakage of the chip. So it's very important that we reduce the leakage per bit there. And as far as, yeah. So in terms of the metal stack requirement for yeah. this new SRAM, um, is, is it a standard yeah, to provide yeah, metal stack? Yeah. And also, uh, how does that affect routing? Uh, so there, there's nothing in the in the, there's nothing in the metal stacks that this uses. This is purely at the transistor and substrate level. Okay. Yeah. Um, or how many for the actual wiring just for a single bit cell? How many metal layers are you using? A, that would depend on the implementation. You could you, you two to start. Right? Yeah. Two. Okay. Yeah. For the uh, uh, the standard lines. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and so of course the question is, does this thing actually exist? Will it work? And well, we're pretty certain, it, uh, confident it will. We've done some TCAD simulations. Uh, they're pretty promising for getting multi-level operations. So fingers crossed for that. And next month we've got a shuttle going out. So. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so 3D stacking. So this is another way we're able to reduce data movement, which is let's get more memory um, onto, the, uh, onto the chip, right? So one way to do is 3D stacking. Number of problems with current, with the current ways we do 3D stacking wide isn't necessarily super popular. Uh, one of them is without a doubt it, it, through Silicon Via. Uh, TSV has a lot of disadvantages. It has key, large keypad zones, um, requirement for electrostatic discharge protection, could go on and on parasitic capacitances, et cetera. But point is, something better is really desired. So this is kind of our wireless link. Um, as you can see, very good numbers um, compared to what the TSV would look like. Uh, the 40 gigabits per second is to demonstrate the total, uh, the total bandwidth that you can push through each link. Doesn't necessarily mean that we'll uh, use CERTES or something to actually push this, but uh, just that's what the link itself is capable of. And uh, it does. It only uses the metal layers, so the it doesn't it doesn't go through it. I mean, it's wireless after all. So uh, basically, that's really advantageous since you can actually do work under there. You can have memory under there, and it's really useful. And because of that, again, we don't need electrostatic discharge protection, which is really nice since it saves a significant amount of power, um, especially when you compare something like a TSV. There is some crosstalk right now. We're just dealing with that by spacing them far apart which deals with the issue. Um, to drive bandwidth higher, you can use techniques like multiplexing and things. Uh, so yeah, I have a pretty waveform there. As you can see, you probably won't see this beautiful waveform in silicon, but um, based on the comparisons we've done to TSVs and doctor coils, it seems to be doing pretty well. And uh, again, these are all on 28 nanometer. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, eight femtojoules per bit. That's pretty much as cheap as going if uh, maybe like one 50 micron stage uh, over on the, die it's, uh, on the die itself. So. You save a significant amount of power simply by just uh, having the memory uh, 3D integrated onto there. Do you know yeah. uh, roughly like comparison to like through chips, uh, ISS, CC? Next slide. <laughs> yeah. Beat me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have a comparison. So this is just to show the maximum achievable bandwidth per uh, square millimeter. So with TSVs, you don't get very much. Um, uh, 400 gigabits per second, pretty high power consumption per bit. Um, there's one big problem with that calculation, though, is that there's no logic at all. So the entire region of die is basically useless. Uh, inductor coils do much better, about double the bandwidth, um, similar amount of power. Now, you can drive that lower, that power lower, or the bandwidth higher. That's going to increase coil area um, or um, decrease or increase power consumption if you want to drive the bandwidth higher. So uh, I chose this as the optimal trade-off. It's possible to get this down to 10 femtojoules per bit, but at the cost of approximately um, quadrupling the area of that. So that is or something, but they do get uh, logic underneath the chip. Uh, we're able to drive up to 10 terabits per second um, through, through these links per square millimeter at a significantly reduced power consumption. Um, again, we also get logic underneath it and we can drive the bandwidth even higher with multiplexing. We don't really have plans to do that right now, but it's a possibility if we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting analog feature. You have undershooting on your red curve. Glitch before the transition. Yeah. What's that about? Is that a simulation effect? Or not because of your inductive coupling or RF? I'm sorry. Uh, undershoot. Undershoot on the red curve. The red curve. The like green oh, has a okay. tube, but slower. Yeah. I did not investigate. Nor normally you have the overshoot at the end of it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, maybe you have to diagram it. It's, 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 it's a digital signal processing scope. I think it's a digital signal process. Could be scope. an artifact and a yeah. scope. Yeah. Yeah. And we can, yeah, we're, we can talk uh, more about well, that. Well, you have this radiation yeah. pattern that seems to suggest you have wireless connection. Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah. So there's well, some it, it kind is, of things there. It's wireless, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can, we can talk more about that. That's uh, okay. Offline, but, yeah. Copy your secret, so. <laughs> yeah. I have a question yeah. on yeah. the previous slide. Go on. yeah. So you're showing uh, eight femtojoules per bit mm -hmm. as opposed to 110 femtojoules. Yep. The thing, it's, you know, because you're not using through silicon via. Yep. But it seems to me that you have a coupling, you know, whether it's going wirelessly or with a wire, there's still, sh I don't see how it can go down by 
I don't know. Well, I guess maybe I don't understand why it goes down at all because it's still coupled even though it's wireless. Right. So, the th okay, there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, TSPs have a very high parasitic capacitance since they're very large. Um, the other reason is TSP, you need electrostatic discharge protection, which adds a decent amount to it. I mean, again, it's, it, this isn't, we're not the only one, we're not the only ones that has power consumption this low. Uh, as I said, through shift, it's possible with inductive coupling to get your uh, power consumption down to around 10 femtojoules, I think, for a bit. But add, that's at the cost of significantly increased area. Got so, it. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Yeah, there we go. The other big problem, the other big problem with uh, 3D stacking has been basically the heat problem, right? So if you have two dice and your total TDP is something like in the range of 300 watts, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be very thermally feasible to stack these two dice on top of each other. And so basically, that, for the majority of high performance applications, this has kind of uh, helped really limit just straight um, 3D integration. I mean, 2.5D is still feasible, uh, 3D not so much. And so basically, so the goal is, so we need to find some way to deal with the thermal problems. This is a gigantic uh, issue, especially if we're talking about something like Volta TDP dice. So, so here, are some, um, here are some, not our, as you can see, obviously not ours, but some uh, uh, thermal analyses uh, models that we didn't disclose ours here for some re uh, for good reasons, but uh, will eventually, obviously. But as you can see, the general point still stands. That basically, these compute regions and, of course, the center of the die have these uh, hot spots. And basically, we need to find. Um, so this is an observation, basically, and we need to find some way to deal with it. And the other observation is that these hot spots also, especially, appear around. Um, compute regions for the most part since compute regions are on average going to have higher thermal uh, thermal density than the memory regions. The memory regions may have, um, they may comprise more power uh, co power consumption overall in the entire die but on a uh, per per uh, per capita basis I guess they have a higher, the compute regions have a higher thermal density. Yeah so there's a couple of ways we had actually attacked a thermal wall um, this is one of them, the other ones we haven't finished uh, patents on, so excuse me for that. But um, basically, the idea is like, well, let's take, uh, let's basically exploit what we've learned from thermal analyses and let's kind of uh, basically apply it. So what, what do we get? Well, the first thing we get is, well, memory regions are cooler than um, compute regions, at least per, at least in terms of density. So let's not put them on top of each other. Um, let's only put memory regions on top of each other and leave compute regions exposed. Um, we also do this thing called thermal multiplexing, which is basically in, in, not acts, not dynamically activate regions of the die that are kind of directly on top of each other, since that means basically um, the low thermal resistance paths that are available here are already going to be saturated, and of course more heat in one region not, not a good thing. So if you're familiar with the literature on uh, power multiplexing, this is somewhat similar um, in the sense that we're doing it in three dimensions instead of two dimensions, and we're doing it at uh, uh, doing it on a more I guess on a finer grained basis rather than on a per core basis. Um, so for example, these ones are probably going to be uh, regions of the uh, memory array that are activated. So this is, so the first one is what we don't want. Second two is in through time, basically how we uh, access them. So we might act dynamically activate these regions and these regions, and we can schedule this out because the deep learning workload is deterministic enough. Yeah, yeah. Before the operations begin, we're going to schedule uh, how these are going to be activated. So operations, your entire chips can, your chips cannot be operated entirely. So some of the parts will be turned off. So right, but I mean, in general, you're not going to be able to dynamically activate all of your die in any case, right? At maximum, yeah. I mean, this can be done on a very fine-grained basis, like so. Those like CPUs, like that do um, like uh, what is it the. Uh, Pipeline, systolic array. Systolic array. Systolic array. Systolic array. Yeah. Oh, they basically activate everything all the time. And well, right, right. So, but, well, for one, this thing generally happens in memory since it's primarily memory that's going to be stacked, so it's easier to do that there. Um, I mean, they, <clears throat> well, in a way, like, at least they activate most of the compute regions when it's pipelined, but there's definitely still, re uh, at least for most matrices and most workloads, there's going to be periods of time where um, parts of it are, aren't activated, right? Like, you're very rarely going to get full utilization. If you look at the TPUV1 paper, which I uh, presume you're referring to, um, they only get, like, really good utilization on, like, one or two workloads. Um, for the majority of their networks, they're only getting something like, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but one was as low as 11%, so. Memory over memory sometimes is not a problem. 
Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what we're doing here anyway. So this wouldn't be really confusing. So, so what would you see as a like guess of activity factor for the logic portion of the chip? So for our chip, or, yeah, um, probably in the 50%-ish range. So that would give you a delivery of petaflop. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's the equivalent of your switching activity? Rate. Yeah, switching, switching activity. In the, in the logic only, yeah. yeah. Who does the scheduling? Oh, so this scheduling is done by the uh, compiler ahead of time. Yeah. So I did promise in my abstract comparisons to some other uh, of the deep learning chips. Um, before I start, I just want to uh, make it very clear. I don't mean this is an attack on anyone. And I want to just say that when I t uh, really, uh, I guess, start getting going on about these external memories, uh, the reason, the, it's not necessarily a bad design choice given the current uh, technology to use off-chip memory and the high bandwidth memory formats. So just keep that and uh, bear that in mind. Uh, so let's start here, first of all. Um, they've publicly stated that all their memory is off die, and immediately, as you can see, that's going to be a little bit of a problem uh, to bring all your memory in off die. It's simply going to be infeasible, right? So that right there pretty much is going to be the uh, end of that. Uh, graph core, for one, um, at least they do get the idea, right? You want to reduce data movement, and you want to increase memory bandwidth, since these are the real bottlenecks in performance. Um, but unfortunately, they also have a couple of issues. Um, First of all, this all-to-all -all interconnect, which is necessitated or on both dice, which is necessitated by their, uh, which is necessitated by basically their synchronization scheme. They call it bulk synchronous parallel. Um, but basically, these things are going to be serious bottlenecks, um, especially as you scale it onwards. Like the, I guess the general takeaway is that the back end of the line is not so glamorous as the front end of the line. But the interconnect delay in the back end of the line is really the limitation, lim limiting factors here. And as you can see, if you have this, which is going to be long wires, it's going to dominate. And eventually, if you keep scaling this as tr you get more transistors, but not necessarily improvement in the interconnects, um, it's going to start to strangle the design. And of course, there is also these chip-to-chip um, -chip links. They only have 300 megabytes on die, so they have 600 megabytes total, but only 600 megabytes on die, on each die. Um, so in order to go to next die, you need to go through these, uh, I presume these are these links. And those are going to be under the realm of at least 10 picojoules per byte, uh, depending on what you use. Uh, so those are going to be very expensive as well. So it's a really close to 300 megabytes on die. And even then, 600 megabytes, you know, depending on um, what memory, or not memory, whatever uh, data sets you're using on it, is probably not going to be enough. And depending on what model you're, you're running uh, as well there. And you know, 1080p images are quite a bit bigger, bigger than the ImageNet images sizes that we use. So we're able to get our memory on chip uh, to about tw on, on 20 nanometer to about one and a half gigabytes. So this is pretty much close enough to fit uh, most of the models that um, you're running today pretty nicely, compactly on die. And um, on uh, 7 and the other FinFET process that are much smaller, we're able to get uh, much more memory in the 6 to 8 gigabyte range. And of course, we have about five times as much overall uh, peak performance that we see there. Anyone have a question? Yeah. What's your die size? 600 square millimeter, and with the 3D integration, yeah. With okay. Yeah, 600 square millimeter. On um, on top of that, we have 3D integration on it. Okay, so on just the logic die, or or so that one and a half is the full die. Size. Yeah, full die exactly. Yeah. Okay. So if your if your data, let me say, it's 40 times 600 megabytes, it's like, yeah. that's like 20 gigabytes. Yeah. Like, oh, we have 1.5. Well, you're still off by order of magnitude. Right? Yeah, this is just to give an example of what it could be. But I mean, for in a uh, okay, a little dip. It depends on what um, we can drive this higher. Actually, we have plans uh, that we have plans to drive that higher, but not that one. I mean, that so it's, I mean, yeah. I guess the point being that, like, if you know they fall off the memory wall, you know, three times earlier than you know, three times as much as yeah, you but, know, but you still you're still going to be IO mount at some point, right? Well, okay. Um, well, I I in terms of uh, data set I like so say uh, the data set that's a different story, but in terms of memory, uh, just general memory I O. Um, where you probably will reach that, uh, sure, it'll be later, but my point is for like probably, let's say, 90% of workloads, this will be enough. And we have plans to drive this higher as well that we you know, haven't been able to publicly reveal yet. So. so compared to, oh, this chip, actually more information became available after this, this morning. So uh, the general point still stands going to uh, off-chip memory is going to be very expensive, about 120 times more expensive instead of 240 times. 
Um, the other thing is basically each, they have about 30 megabytes of total memory on die um, information as of this morning. Um, they have, uh, and they're pretty much, they're relying upon the software managed memory on high bandwidth memory uh, and to manage the interspersed tensors across memory. So I'm going to, that's approximately what they said in the release. So I'm going to assume that to mean basically they're relying heavily upon their high bandwidth memory to do the heavy lifting. And that's going to be extremely energy intensive to do. And another interesting thing is these, um, about just large memories in general, not necessarily specific to Nirvana, but the physical interfaces for high bandwidth memory, if you've looked at, let's say, the uh, die shots of a really large GPU, like a Fiji or something, you'll notice that the HBM um, physical interface is actually quite large. So even going through that will, it will incur some level of data movement cost uh, on die. Of course, nothing compared to how much this is going to cost, but just something to keep in mind. Uh, compared to the TPU, so TPU v1, um, probably a little bit rushed, which explains a couple of the decisions. Uh, TPU v2 may be a bit of a better comparison, but just to, nonetheless, to give an example here, um, basically they have this unified uh, memory, which is really uh, kind of, uh, throws them off to a large extent. They're only able to get about 24 megabytes uh, onto there, which is enough for some cases, but still not, uh, still not going to be ideal. And plus, to, by having such a large single memory array being monolithic, assuming that's how their actual implementation is, it's going to be very expensive in terms of just in general accessing that thing, um, data movement on the die itself, just even inside a memory array. And um, basically, the in, you can probably incur some pretty gigantic uh, uh, capacitances on the bit lines if you have such a large uh, memory array. And um, the other thing is there, the bandwidth to and from their uh, from their memory array and their matrix multiply and uh, just in general their compute units is very low. Um, we're able to get around to anywhere from 100 to I think a thousand times. Yeah, a thousand times that in aggregate bandwidth. So uh, significantly greater there. And basically the two costs they really suffer from are from going to be on-chip data movement and they, on the first generation they ended up accessing uh, DRAM as well. So that's going to be uh, en enormously expensive. But again, the TPU v2 doesn't use that. So maybe a better comparison should be there. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, so again, it's a better comparison probably to TPU v2. Um, so again, the problem here is really the, the high bandwidth memory. Um, going off die is just going to be too expensive to really be useful. Um, they have fixed, uh, at least they say they're systolic arrays, uh, systolic array matrix multiplier units. Um, so these things really don't have any programmability. So I mean, that could be a disadvantage. If you're Google scale, you probably can make another chip if uh, something else becomes common. But it's just something important to keep in mind would be, uh, would be that. And of course, this seems to be a largely monolithic design as well on here with uh, some advantages since they split it into two at least there. And I also get asked a lot, um, what about like analog approaches, right? Have you considered analog approaches? And so, well, yes, we have. And actually, we did a little uh, side incursion on that a, a couple of years ago. But basically, there are some, we found there are some serious problems with analog approaches in general. Um, so even for deep learning, as it turns out, that uh, d deep learning can't tolerate like n zero or like really low precision. It does have some precision bounds. It's more tolerant to lower precision than, I don't know, let's say uh, HPC workload. But um, for the most part, it's still going to have some level of uh, intolerance to low precision. So as far as I've seen in literature, there's been no evidence of that. There's been at least one company, I think Mythic, that said that they can retain accuracy. Okay, I'll give them that. Um, but basically, the current approaches, first of all, are flash memory based. This is a bit of a big problem because they're uh, the endurance issue. And this is for top of the line uh, SLC nor flash, by the way. So this is intended more for um, IoT sort of applications, I presume. Um, not really for high performance applications where you're continuously just running data. Um, the other thing is that it requires very intense, uh, power intensive, area intensive, and also very hard to scale are the, AD, the ADCs and DACs, right? Um, so those are going to be a serious issue as well. Um, the flash memory itself, if you've seen um, Ganta or just even casually looked at a uh, flash memory scaling conference, you'll see that the uh, scaling of a floating gate transistor is extremely difficult to do. Uh, and so that could possibly be an issue there. And the final thing is it really doesn't so much solve the data movement problem. And the reason for that is because, so you, in one processing element, or not processing element, one memory array, you can do processing, let's say, right, analog computation. But now if you want to move that to another, uh, let's say, region of the die, which you'll need to no matter how dense it is, 
then you're still going to need to transmit it over some sort of lines. And the problem with interconnect lines um, here is that um, if you've seen uh, um, this current sensing, current sensing, by the way, has been proposed as an alternative to current uh, interconnection schemes to um, increase the speed. And But if you look at it, it looks a lot like a damped harmonic oscillator that degrades extremely quickly. So it's pretty much going to be impossible to retain a good analog signal going over those lines. And you're going to need to add some sort of compensation, like, um, and most likely this is going to mean you're turning into digital signal, which you're, you're back to square one in terms of data movement there. Um, yeah, and I mean, so there is difficulties with that as well. And so finally we get to the part where, okay, this is great, I don't care how good of a processor you have, how to actually use it, right? Maybe I'm a deep learning, deep learning guy, how to actually use this thing, right? So this is really nice because the deep learning community has, and all the frameworks have started to settle around this uh, abstraction for intermediate representations called the computational graph. And um, what's really nice is Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon have gone in on this project, which they call Onyx. And I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, at least. Um, and that basically does a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the work for us, which is basically TensorFlow, Torch, whatever cafe, whatever framework you want to use. It emits some sort of a computational graph intermediate representation. For example, Onyx has already been integrated, um, I think, with PyTorch. And, and TensorFlow is a work in progress, I think, can import. Um, so basically, we would intercept this, and we have our uh, little graph compiler, which isn't so much a compiler, uh, possibly a little bit of a misnomer since it's relatively simple to lay it out onto the uh, actual hardware, but we call it a compiler, sure. Uh, DNNCC, it's our nickname for it after GCC. But the, re the real takeaway point here is that for you as a user, don't see anything, right? So you write your TensorFlow code, you go tomorrow, and it runs exactly the same as it, except you'll note, yeah. And everything onto your chip, like from this high level yeah. representation, is easy. It's, it's, I mean, okay, well, compared to like something if we were trying to, I would say, port LLVM to new chip. Okay. Yeah, I mean, easy will be relative. I mean, I guess compared to the, yeah, I, I suppose it's relative. But I mean, com okay. yeah, compared to something like, what, like, suppose us uh, porting LLVM to like a new, uh, to completely new architecture, that would be pretty difficult, right? Why, why do you say that that would be difficult? I'm not a compiler guy, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just seems like there's a lot of complexity here because yeah, like, so you're not locked first of all. So yeah, you doing... yeah you don't yeah a lot, you don't see many of the mechanisms we have to make it easier for it. But um, basically, we have um, basically the action more at the um, I guess more at the more like what we know at the detail level is that it's a lot. Uh, lot not a lot, but at least a little bit different from what you see. Like it's not clocked, but um, it's done in such a way that the compiler sees some uh, some types of guarantees on it, so it's easier for it's easier for it to schedule. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we weren't able to review. I can talk more offline if you. So basically, we don't want to have a most general solution, as long as it works for let's say 99% of the cases, we are happy. Yeah, and like the last person of cases, it's going to run really slow, but it's it's fine. Yeah, but you know, those like for those for that's going to be the majority of the applications we work on, right? Yeah. So what happens to, let's say, custom nodes in the computational graph, right? If somebody writes a custom layer. Yeah. Yeah. So the custom layer basically becomes a little bit more difficult. You, but you have to implement it as some sort of um, some representation of functions, um, not necessarily functions, operations. I mean, um, in the uh, computational graph. So let's say your simple example would be like, uh, let's say I want to implement dilated convolutions, right? So then I would um, represent that as some sort of um, nesting of, let's say, addition and convolution function um, in the computational graph. And then we simply take that and compile it, just this normal. The, the issue arises when you start to use things like if you have a call to a library or something, then you have to, in, uh, th that's when things get hairy, but, um, so that's when, you can, th that's when the compilation becomes difficult. But for cases like that, it's going to slow down other chips uh, quite a decent bit as well. But. Yeah. So for basically, again, for this is intended for like ninety nine percent of more workloads. This is going to be a, a perfect fit. But yeah. So what kind of workloads are you looking at? So working at um, basically confnets, um, LSTMs, RNNs, uh, the various applications, spatial transformer networks, um, all sorts of things. And really, the only thing that's the against. Hmm? Yeah. Oh yeah. Fully connected, of course. That's the basis. But uh, really, it only becomes difficult when you have significant amounts of control flow. Really, that's when difficulty arises. Yeah. Are there any limitations on the uh, transfer operations uh, programmability? Can I write my own? You can write your own, but here, here again, here's the thing. The biggest thing here is that control flow basically slows it down. 
So, I mean, as, as a general heuristic control flow slows it down. Um, yeah. How There's a little bit more, but uh, probably. Uh, uh, slow down by how much? Order of magnitude, five times? Uh, again, it depends on how much, but yeah, it, it's, it's really hard to estimate. It also depends on what it is, right? Like if you have something similar, like simple, like what a rally would be, that, that may not be at all of a slowdown. Uh, but if it's something really complicated, then like a very long switch or something that could slow down. Yeah. Is that just training or inference or behind training? Um, so basically, we'll, be, we'll do it for both. But um, our first chip, for business reasons, has to be an inference chip. But um, we intend to architecture to do both. Yeah. You're plenty of 600 square millimeter for inference? Yeah. That, I mean, this is, that's intended for data center type for okay. code technically. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, we can cut that die up too. Yeah. This looks very interesting. But are you familiar with the similar system developed by? Professor Jack Dennis at MIT, perchance, I suspect the, you're not. The da data flow? Uh, uh, he, he started pushing that 55 years ago without much success. Yeah, that's what. But it's uh, similar enough that since uh, I oppose all patents, I will tip him off to try to blow a hole in yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's our plans around data flow. So, um, well, yeah. In terms of uh, for laws levels, like what what do you see the difference between your matrix multiplication level three versus level one, level two? No data on that yet. I'm not going to speculate. Uh, well, this isn't intended to be like a like a. Uh, bl this isn't intended to be uh, like a kind of HPC chip, right? So we've been uh, we're benchmarking more like the. Uh, VG, uh, like workloads like, well, not VGG so much, but uh, ResNet, stuff like that. How, how do you see the performance difference between your sort of AlexNet CNN versus, you know, an LSTM? What, what sort of performance drop off? Okay, well, this is entirely going to depend on how large LSTM is. Like, any model size estimate? A million activations. Yeah. A million activations probably should see, see something, no, no drop off at all. So, e so each one of your. DNN units contains one activation, or how does that? No, so um, so um, our DLEs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so our DLEs have a uh, large. So basically, their their activation weight in memory is uh, sector. Uh, so basically, it's sector changeable. So they like there's I think there's six sectors we're going for right now. Uh, yeah. So basically, the those sectors contain some amount of memory, which can be reconfigured to be um, all six for mem for weights only, or all six for activations and anything in between. So that, so basically, the point is that it would be reconfigured approximately to how many activations you would have, but it's definitely not one. It's a lot more. I mean, we only have like 2,400 of these on a pretty large die, right? So you'd have fit several activations onto one. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Versus in matrix multiply case, where, where when you're multiplying two mm -hmm. matrix, matrix A and B, and you're repeatedly accessing element A and matrix A for each multiplication, there would be a drop off in your case versus a scenario where you're not having that kind of cash friendly nature. Right, right. So this is again where it's not necessarily intended to be for uh, general purpose because if you write something, look, and let me answer a question. So for generally the way we have LSTMs implemented right now is also like, con uh, con I don't have the architecture slide, but it's implemented a little bit more in a hardwired way. Uh, so that that's not so much of an issue um, right now. But if you go write something, let's say that's kind of looks similar to an LSTM, but isn't kind of uh, is doesn't have let's say preset preset um, hardware to, to be able to assist it, you're, you'll see a drop off there. Sure. Yeah, I guess my point is like the uh, kind of innate form of your uh, sure. layers is as a matrix vector product rather than a matrix matrix product. Yeah. It's because yeah. you know existing architectures. Uh, with their caching systems are so good at matrix multiplication that that's what their you know the problems reformed into a uh, level three blahs one rather than a level two, um, and so if you're doing it in a level tw two form that reduces the amount of work you actually need to do. I mean yeah, but again okay well this is kind of bringing back to the uh, date. Uh, for the most part, we see our performance drop off not necessarily when the compute requirements are different, but when the uh, memory. Uh, systems are different. For the most part, we don't see compute impl impacting. Uh, uh, the compute probably generally doesn't impact us that much in terms of how much it is. It's going to be more impactful when the memory, um, when let's say we have way more memory in one layer and way less on the other. Then it's, we see memory being the primary uh, 
difference in terms of how much performance we get. I mean, it's the same compute. You're still doing multiplication. No, no, no. I get, I get. Yeah. Use multiply add. It's that. Yeah, you're just accessing piece, different yeah, pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I got what you mean, but my. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but that yeah. really is, that begs the question. Are these really matrices or rank one outer products of vectors? They're, well, you nest it from. Uh, are they rank one or rank two? The, the Google guys finally admitted that tensors are actually rank two matrices, okay, yeah, which is yeah. the sum of two outer Fair products, right, yeah. which is vectors. Yeah, it's so is that the same thing here? Yeah. Because then you shouldn't use TensorFlow. This is. Well, I mean, it is not tensors. Come on, okay, you, I, okay, your I, memory complexity I will, will blow up. I, I will. Okay, I will agree that there's uh, there is someone who said that we use the word tensor a little bit too much in deep learning, but I mean, not only a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> there hey, is no tensors. I, if it's, if it's rank one or rank two matrix, then it is not a tensor. I it's not even a matrix. I actually agree with you. Having two other products, vectors is more more efficient. I'm not the one who named okay, it. Okay, so. sorry. <laughs> 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 We're once in a row, I have to protect that. If it was me, I wouldn't have named it, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, of course, the one is that <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I mean, tensor sounds better than matrix, so I suspect that's why Google, yeah. Um, so yeah, timeline basically, okay, when can I? Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah wrong person to get that. But uh, yeah, so when can I actually get one? Um, of course, as I said, the MPW is going to validate what I suppose could be called a more it's risky uh, technologies to 3D stacking in the memory cell. Um, everything else uh, will be if things go to plan. Um, we uh, hope to get some engineering samples shipping to some early uh, early partners, and eventually get a 28 uh, sh something shipping on 28, and eventually all the way to the 7 nanometer FinFET. Uh, eventually, that will be mass coned. Yeah, I think that's about it.